Excellent. Thanks so much, and I appreciate the invitation to uh, to be a part of this uh, great school. And it's uh, it's humbling to follow Ken. Uh, like 16 years ago, going on 17, Ken taught me in a different summer school, uh, geobiology summer school, and he taught me how to um, many things. But one of the most exciting things was culturing magnetotactic bacteria and flipping around the magnets and watching these little bacteria go from side to side as they, uh, as they tracked along the uh, magnetic field. And uh, it, yesterday at lunch, I got into a conversation about career paths and everything with a bunch of students. Um, we can do more of that during lunch today. But uh, given that Ken had the opening talk today, I also wanted to advertise to many of you with a deep interest in biology and geobiology to look into the geobiology summer school, which is still going, right? Uh, uh, I forget if it's, the, it's still run by Agron or, yeah. yeah. Diane and Woody and crew were doing it. Sessions and crew. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great summer school that uh, will, where you'll get your hands uh, wet in the lab. Uh, okay. Um, again, thank you. And uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. But please do ask questions. That'll be it'll be more fun for me if you interrupt me. Uh, I give this talk a lot, and so I'm sick of hearing myself talk. So the more that you ask questions, the more fun it'll be for me. We have been exploring our solar system with robotic spacecraft for a bit over 55 years. The first flyby of Venus was done in the fall of 1962. And this diagram shows you a, a line for every robotic spacecraft at NASA and ESA and the Russian Space Agency and the Japanese to outer space during that time frame. And as you can see, there are many lines that go to the moon and Mars and Venus and the sun, but there are just a few lines that go beyond the asteroid belt. These are lines that represent spacecraft with names like Pioneer and Voyager and Galileo and Cassini and New uh, Horizons. And by merit of these few spacecraft, we ha now have good evidence that vast, potentially global, liquid water oceans exist beyond Earth. This is what I like to call the, the portrait of the ocean worlds of our solar system. At the center, of course, is the Earth with the ocean that we know and love and need to protect. Around the Earth, I've placed Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, three moons of Jupiter, Titan and Enceladus, two moons of Saturn, and I've even got Neptune's curious moon Triton in here. These are worlds that are covered in ice. And in the case of Titan, it's also got an atmosphere. But beneath their icy shells, we think there are liquid water oceans. And of course, if we've learned anything from life on Earth, it's that where you find the liquid water, you generally find life. And so in that context, these worlds are incredibly exciting in that they could be host to trees of life of their own. Uh, you've seen various diagrams of the Tree of Life throughout the past few days. One of the questions that motivates my interest in these ocean worlds, these worlds like Europa and Celadus and Titan, is the prospect that they might ha have separate independent origins of life and give rise to uh, separate unique trees of life. And it's important to put this in context. Uh, Ken just gave a, a wonderful talk about Mars, and I love Mars. But for the most part, our search for life on Mars is a search for past life. We are looking for life as preserved in the rock record. And make mo no mistake, if the Curiosity rover today were to turn a corner uh, on Mount Sharp and see stromatic, stromatolytic-like features indicative of microbes on Mars three and a half billion years ago, that would be truly groundbreaking. But we would not be able to find the DNA or the biochemistry of that organism in those rocks. To really understand whether or not separate independent trees of life have formed elsewhere in our solar system or beyond, we need to go to worlds where life could be alive today, where life, uh, where we could eventually study that life directly to see what underpins its biochemistry. 
does it run on DNA, RNA, proteins, and ATP, or is there some other game in town? That is one of the fundamental questions that underpins astrobiology and uh, the, the intrigue of these ocean worlds. They have oceans today, and as I'll describe in this talk, they could be habitable and possibly even inhabited. Now, coupled with the fact that they could harbor extant life that we could study and, and understand the biochemistry, by merit of being so far out in the solar system, they also to some extent are protected from possible cross-contamination. Earth and Mars were transferring material a lot during the early days of the solar system. And so it could be that if we do find life on Mars, it is connected to our tree of life. Or maybe we were once Martians, et cetera. The, the back and forth means that even if we were to find uh, fossil evidence of life on Mars, Mars or extant life on Mars, let's imagine we found DNA-based life on Mars today, I think we would have a hard time deconvolving that as a separate origin. Whereas if we found DNA-based life on Europa, I would be inclined to argue that, that uh, since Europa is so much harder to get a space rock to, I would be inclined to argue that that might be indicative of a biochemical convergence to DNA and RNA as your uh, biochemical pathway. So again, these are incredibly exciting worlds in the context of, of potentially harboring extant life that could answer some of the biggest questions that humanity has ever asked. Now, the chance to give this talk to uh, uh, astronomers and exoplanet specialists is, is great because you all know and love the idea of the habitable zone. And in our own solar system, we have this idea of the Goldilocks scenario where the habitable zone is defined by being at just the right distance from your parent star such that energy from the sun can maintain a liquid water ocean on the surface. You get too close, you get too hot, you, you burn off any ocean, you get too far away, you get too cold, you lose your ocean. It's obviously much more complicated than that, but the point of this talk is not to go into detail on the nuances of, of our own habitable zones. But the simple point is that these ocean worlds of the outer solar system are telling us and teaching us that this is an old Goldilocks. There's a new Goldilocks for habitability in town, and it's one wherein the energy for maintaining and sustaining liquid water comes not from the energy of your parent star, but rather from the tidal energy and tug and pull as these moons go around their giant primaries. And there's no better example of this new Goldilocks than the four large Galilean satellites that orbit Jupiter. In this new Goldilocks, Io is kind of like Venus. Io does not have a, a liquid water ocean. It lost any water that it once had. Io is the most volcanically active body in our solar system. Io is more volcanically active than the Earth. And it is so tidally active, it is so volcanically active because of that tidal tug and pull as it orbits Jupiter, which is some 318 times uh, as massive as the Earth. Further out, Callisto is a little bit like Mars. Callisto, we think, does have an ocean, but it's maintained predominantly through radiogenic decay. It's maybe got a, a slight whiff of tidal energy dissipation, but its ice shell is old, as evidenced by the pockmark of the, the craters in this image, and it's quite thick. And so even if it does have an ocean, it's an ocean that is not well represented by the chemistry of the ice shell, and getting through that ice shell is going to be exceedingly problematic. So Callisto might be a little bit like Mars in this new Goldilocks. But in the middle, we've got Europa and Ganymede, and Europa in particular might be at this new sweet spot for the new Goldilocks zone. It's got just the right amount of tidal energy so as to maintain and sustain a liquid water ocean beneath a relatively thin ice shell, an ice shell that's maybe a few miles to as many as 20 miles in thickness. Um, but it's an ice shell where we think the ocean is communicating with the surface and the ice shell could well serve as a window into the ocean below. The Jovian system is particularly interesting in the context of tidal energy dissipation because uh, as some of you may appreciate, when it comes to orbital dynamics, uh, planets and moons like to get tidally locked and then turn their orbits into near-perfect circles. Well, just as a brief aside, in the Jovian system, 
part of what maintains the tidal energy dissipation is this beautiful resonance that the first three of the Galilean satellites share, where Io, Europa, and Ganymede each pull on each other to make sure that uh, their orbits don't go perfectly circular, which would then uh, greatly reduce the amount of tidal energy dissipation. So for every one orbit of Europa, Io goes around twice. And for every one orbit of Ganymede, Europa goes around twice. This little sort of uh, planetary swing set, if you will, uh, maintains the eccentricity that drives the tidal energy dissipation. What's the magnitude of this, uh, it, this new Goldilocks and the, the tidal energy dissipation? On Earth, we've got about 60 to 80 milliwatts per square meter across our seafloor on average. So when you think about all the hydrothermal vents and the energy and, and everything that happens in our ocean, that's driven by this number. Obviously, in some places, it's near zero. In other places, it's much higher. But on Io, we've got about 2,500 milliwatts per square meter. Europa, we don't have very good constraints because it's unclear how much of that energy is being dissipated in the ice shell versus the mantle. But model estimates range from about 10 to 800 milliwatts per square meter. And then Enceladus, there's a, um, a, a south pole anomaly that I'll get into. Uh, so we don't actually have a good number on the, the global average, but um, the, the integrated uh, amount of um, uh, power coming out is about 16 gigawatts. Now to give you a kind of a broad classification before I get into detail on, uh, on Europa and Enceladus in particular, I want to kind of frame the worlds in our solar system in the following way. Europa, Enceladus, and Titan are particularly relevant to this new Goldilocks, and they are worlds where we could potentially find water and carbon-based life. Life as we know it, we can form a hypothesis around the search for that life, and Ken went through a lot of the, uh, the mechanics of what those signs of life might be on Mars, and those signs of life apply equally well to these, these ocean worlds. Titan I also classify in a weird life category. Uh, Titan has methane, ethane, lakes, and rivers, and a methane meteorological cycle that could, by utilizing some chemistry that we have yet to replicate in the lab, it could give rise to life that uses methane as the liquid solvent, a nonpolar solvent used to, to build life. So I like to put that in a box of, of weird life. We can't really formulate a hypothesis around it, but it's, it sure would be exciting to look at. Ganymede, Callisto, and to some extent Titan fall into a category where I worry that they might actually be too big and the ice shells might be uh, too thick so as to have water in contact with a rocky seafloor. And I'll get into the importance of that a bit later. Uh, there, are all, there, are also a, there is also a class of world uh, such as Ceres and even Mars, where, where these are relic uh, ocean worlds. Um, Mars may well have experienced some snowball uh, periods where it had ice-covered oceans. And then there are unknowns. Um, uh, Triton and, and Pluto, they could well have liquid water oceans mixed with some ammonia that could serve as a bit of an antifreeze. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a description of these, these kind of sandwiched oceans, on worlds like Ganymede, Callisto, and Titan, it may be that the liquid water layer is sandwiched between an ice shell on the top made of ice one that we all appreciate floats. But deeper in, the pressure gets so great that you actually give rise to higher phases of water ice, phases of ice that are denser than liquid water and thus sink. And so you may well have liquid water trapped between uh, ice layers, which might be bad from a, um, from a geochemistry standpoint. So the way I've organized this talk is sort of uh, in the, um, uh, by breaking it into the keystones of life. I'll talk a bit about why we think we know that these oceans exist, why we think we know that they have water. I'll get into a bit about the elements uh, that uh, might be available to help make those worlds habitable. Uh, and I'll get into the energy that uh, could help drive life on and within these ocean worlds. 
So water. Um, and again, I'm just going to focus on Europa and Enceladus in the interest of time, but I'm happy to answer questions about other worlds. Uh, how do we think we know that Europa has an ocean beneath its ice shell? I like to break this into a discovery that, uh, that takes three easy pieces. First is to find a rainbow connection. What do I mean by that? Well, many of you in this audience are spectroscopists. Uh, spectroscopy, I like to say, is just a, a fancy word for studying rainbows. Uh, and so if you take a rainbow of Europa, as Vasily Moreau did back in the 1960s, you see this beautiful stepwise function. That is highly diagnostic of water ice. Um, I should mention that most of these ice-covered ocean worlds do not have atmospheres, again, with the exception of Titan. And so a lot of times when we're doing spectroscopy, we're doing spectroscopy of solid surfaces. Uh, and so the spectral resolution needed is you know, four wave numbers instead of uh, a hundredth of a wave number, as many of you atmospheric scientists uh, often need. So some 350 years after Galileo discovered the Galilean satellites, uh, we go from Europa being a point of light to being a point of light that is, uh, is a ball of ice. The next piece of the puzzle, I like to say, is babysitting a spacecraft. What do I mean by this? Well, here's the Galileo spacecraft and here's the, uh, the deep space network. By carefully tracking a spacecraft, engineers and scientists can work together to tease out the moment of inertia of a body, whether it's Europa or a planet or some other uh, moon or world. And I won't go into great detail on this, but it's beautiful physics. It's physics 101. You can see you know, uh, the, the standard gravitational force equation up there. In order to tease out the moment of inertia, you go to the gravitational potential equation. And by carefully tracking the acceleration and deceleration, the redshift and blue shift of the signal coming from a spacecraft like Galileo, which flew by Europa, you can see what the gravity well, so to speak, looks like. And from that, you can get the moment of inertia. And from the moment of inertia, you can back out the density uh, of various layers within uh, Europa. And so what that led to for Europa is a core of iron, or an iron sulfur core, overlain by a thick layer of rocks, of silicates, similar to our mantle uh, that, that we have here on Earth. And the gravity data required an outer shell of some 100 to 200 kilometers in thickness of material that was of nearly unit density. And the best explanation for that low density material is water in either liquid or solid phase. Now, the subtle difference in density between solid and liquid water uh, is, is too small to be resolved by the gravity data. So this leads us to piece number three, which I like to say is adhering to airport security. Uh, now, normally I like to show pretty pictures. This is a little bit fuzzy, and I apologize, but I was trying not to get arrested as I was taking this picture at JFK Airport. Uh, what do I mean by adhering to airport security? Well, when you walk through a doorway, uh, not one of these big cylinders that we now have to go through, but when you walk through one of those standard doorways at an airport, you're walking through a time-varying magnetic field. And if you've got a conductor in your pocket, that time-varying magnetic field excites electric currents, induced electric currents. Those induced electric currents give rise to what we call an induced magnetic field. And the doorway has a little sensor on it that detects those induced magnetic fields. And so if an induced magnetic field is detected, the alarm goes off, you get pulled aside, you get the pat down. Well, when Galileo flew by Europa, the alarm went off, and Europa basically got the pat down. In other words, Galileo detected an induced magnetic field around Europa. It did not detect an intrinsic magnetic field. Europa, to the best of our knowledge, does not have a magnetic field similar to what the Earth has. The magnetic field around Europa rises and falls in direct response to Jupiter's time-varying field. Again, I won't go into too much detail on this, but it's beautiful physics, physics 101, Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law. Uh, up in the left is Jupiter. And in red, I've got the butterfly of the dipole component of Jupiter's magnetic field. It's tilted by almost 10 degrees. Uh, 
the I, E, G, and C there are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And Jupiter spins on its axis. Jupiter's day is 10 hours. Think about that for a second. Our day is 24 hours, and we're just this piddling little rocky planet. Jupiter is whipping around at 10 hours. So what that means is that if you're Europa, at one point in time, the magnetic field looks like this. Uh, another point in time, it looks like this. You've got a DDDT, uh, which means that this is kind of like you walking through the, the metal detector. Europa is basically going through the metal detector that is created by the time varying field of Jupiter. And so when the alarm went off, when an, an induced field was sensed around Europa, the logic then leads to what could give rise to that induced magnetic field. When you walk through that doorway, the implication is that if the alarm goes off, you've got a conductor in your pocket. Well, what conductor could Europa possibly be carrying in its pocket? I told you that we've got an iron core. Could that give rise to the, to the induced field? No. It turns out the iron core is too small and essentially too far away to explain the observation. What about that rocky mantle? No, rocks are not conductive enough. And so uh, even giving them a, a, an unusually high conductivity does not lead to a, a magnetic response sufficient to explain the data. But that outer layer of water in either ice or liquid form, now we start to get into interesting terrain for a possible conductor that could explain the data. And it turns out that if you have a salty ocean beneath that ice shell, a salty ocean of tens of kilometers in thickness, possibly as much as 100 kilometers in thickness, if you have a salty ocean beneath an icy shell, that beautifully explains the induced magnetic field signature uh, that was observed around Europa. So that's the final piece of the puzzle that leads to our current understanding for what Europa looks like. When you peel away the outside, you've got that iron core, the rocky mantle, then this roughly 60 mile deep or 100 kilometer deep ocean overlain by a, a relatively thin ice shell. Uh, let's see, I think I do have time to do a fun demo. Uh, I was intrigued that the, the biologists and chemists uh, did, did demos yesterday, so I figured I might as well bring a demo. I love E&M, and, uh, uh, and especially when it comes to E&M that helps discover a, a global liquid water ocean that could harbor life. Uh, it's fun to do little magic tricks related to it. So that same physics that I just told you about, the induced magnetic field, uh, it's the same physics that underpins the following demonstration. I've got two copper tubes here. These are just plumbing tubes that I picked up at the hardware store. I've got them taped together so that it's basically uh, uh, two racetracks. I've got a little dowel here of wood, and then I've got a neodymium, a, a strong magnet. I'm gonna drop these into the tubes at the same time which piece is gonna come out first, the wood or the magnet? How many think the wood will come out first? Okay, how many think the magnet will come out first? And how many did not raise your hand? <laughs> we got an interesting split there. It's about one third, one third, one third. <laughs> okay, so I will drop these through and you will see, so the, the wood, uh, sorry, in the back you can't really see, but the wood is on my left, uh, your right, and the magnet is on my right, your left. The magnet takes a lot longer to go through the tube, and there's really no friction in there. It didn't bounce around. You might have heard a little bit of a clink. But the reason the magnet takes so long to go through is because as it's falling, it is exciting electric currents in the tube. Those electric currents create an a induced magnetic field. That induced magnetic field actually ends up pushing back against the magnet, and slowing it down. Again, this is just physics 101, beautiful Faraday's law stuff. The same physics that drives this little kind of physics magic trick is the third piece of the puzzle of how we think we know that a global liquid water ocean exists beneath Europa's surface. Okay, let's move on to Enceladus. How do we think we know that Enceladus has uh, a liquid water ocean? 
Well, Enceladus is curious. Uh, it's shown here with Saturn in the background and the rings. It's only 5, or 500 kilometers in diameter. Uh, and yet when you take a close look at it, you see that it's quite curious in, uh, in sort of the footprint of its icy surface. To the north, we have many craters, but to the south, there are essentially no craters. And the south is hallmarked by these fractures that cut across the South Pole. When the Cassini spacecraft first took these images, the science and engineering team then decided to take a closer look at these fractures, but to get uh, just the right alignment such that sunlight could be seen glinting off of the fractures, and those images revealed this. Now, you should ooh and awe at this picture, especially, there we go. <laughs> Because this is a truly astonishing picture. This is a picture that, first and foremost, is an engineering mar marvel, uh, but then it also shows an ocean jumping out of these fractures. Uh, an ocean, which I'll get into in a little bit, uh, that is informed by the chemistry of these plumes. And the Cassini spacecraft flew through these plumes uh, to an altitude as low as about 50 kilometers. Uh, absolutely stunning. And there are a few other lines of evidence for a, a global ocean on, on Enceladus, including the, the libration of Enceladus's ice shelf. So the, the plumes in the south initially uh, led to the idea that there was a south polar sea. Um, subsequent to that, uh, Paul Thomas and others discovered that the ice shell has a large libration. It wobbles back and forth too much so as to be consistent with an ice shell locked to a rocky interior. In other words, the ice shell needs to be free floating. And that large libration is part of what has led the community to uh, the consensus that not only is there a South Polar Sea, but that ice shell must be decoupled from the sea floor uh, and, uh, and it must be a global ocean. And I'll get into more of the chemistry that helps uh, implicate an ocean within Enceladus in a, in a bit. That's the big picture for water. Let's move on to elements. Um, Ken detailed the periodic table and, and went through a bunch of this, so I won't spend too much time. But when we think about the elements that are needed for life, we've got the chinops, uh, or I forget how, what Tori Holler likes to say, sponge. Uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different ways you can uh, play around with the alphabet here. Um, but life as we know it needs about 54 elements from the periodic table. And beautifully, when it comes to forming a habitable world, the outer solar system is actually a great place to be. Uh, and contrary to obvious evidence, Earth, from an elemental standpoint, is actually a bad place for life. Uh, in the early days of solar system formation, a lot of the volatiles that were carrying the, the essential elements for life were baked out of the inner solar system and sent to the colder regions of the outer solar system. This is, of course, why we have predominantly rocky planets in the inner solar system and uh, gas giants and ice giants in the outer solar system. So when you look at these vapor pressure curves for all sorts of interesting species, I'll simplify this, uh, you see that worlds like uh, Enceladus, Europa, and Titan formed in regions where it was cold enough so as to retain many of the volatiles that Earth itself uh, could not retain. Uh, this is why on Titan, for example, we have a lot of methane. Uh, out at Europa, we've got a lot of sulfur. Uh, in the outer reaches of the solar system, there's also a lot of ammonia. Meanwhile, on Earth, one of the key planetary science questions is how did Earth get its water? Uh, we have, by some estimates, too much water to be explained by the formation of the Earth itself, and that's where com comets get implicated uh, in the uh, delivery of water. Now, when it comes to the essential uh, to elements that life needs, uh, the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are all, are all well and good, and they are um, captured in the, 
in these volatiles. But you also need the metals, you need the heavier elements, and so you want to have the light elements, but you also want to have the heavy elements. And a good proxy for having the heavy elements is the density of these ocean worlds. Here we've got a plot of radius versus density, and you can see that some of these worlds, Tethys, Iapetus, uh, Iapetus uh, Mimas, these worlds have a density of basically water and water ice. Uh, which means that there's not much room in their density to accommodate heavy material like rocks. Meanwhile, we've got rocky satellites like Io, our moon, and even Europa falls in that sort of upper bracket. Uh, and when we look at how to, to kind of break down the availability of the heavier elements that are represented in rocks that lead to a higher density, we can see that if you go too high, you've got too much rock and too little ice. Uh, if you go too low, you've got too much ice and too little rock. If you go too far out, and this is what I talked about a little bit earlier, um, you might be too large and you might have icy sea floors. And so even though you might have rocks deeper in, in your interior, you might be cut off from those rocks uh, by merit of those icy sea floors. So there's a bit of a new, there's a bit of an additional Goldilocks zone where you kind of want to be in this region that Europa's in Enceladus, yeah, you got enough rock in the interior there. Uh, so there's kind of this zone here where uh, you've got the volatiles and the heavy elements. Okay, let's get back to Enceladus. Um, when it comes to the elements and also implicating an ocean, the Cassini spacecraft did wonders for us in that it actually flew through the plumes. It also captured material from the E-ring of Saturn. The E-ring is sourced by the plumes. And the two mass spectrometers on board Cassini revealed that the plumes have not just water, but also methane, simple organics, carbon monoxide, some cracked off pieces possibly of more complex organics, uh, carbon dioxide. And then with the cosmic dust analyzer, this for me was the real uh, sort of smoking gun for an ocean. Uh, the cosmic dust analyzer which is basically a, a bucket that uh, material smashes into and then you do time of flight mass spectrometry. The, um, the CDA data revealed that there are salts in the plume. And up until that discovery of salt in the plume, there were many people in the planetary science community who, myself included, as excited as we were about the plumes and this result, there was something else in the solar system that kind of has that same chemical fingerprint, and that is comets. Comets have uh, tails, and if you look at the tails of comets, you see water and organic. So that could argue against an ocean. But with salt, you really do need a water-rock interaction, uh, as shown in the, the diagram here. And so with the discovery of salt, you've get, now got the water, the jets, the ice shell that's fracturing, uh, and a need to have some form of water rock interaction that can allow those salts to be leached out of the, of the rocky interior. And then subsequent to that discovery was the discovery of uh, SiO2, uh, nanograins of silica, um, and also hydrogen coming out uh, of the plumes. And the hydrogen plus the silica led to a few papers arguing that within Enceladus is not just an active rocky seafloor, but a seafloor that has potentially low temperature hydrothermalism akin to serpentinization, which you've heard a bit about in the past few days. So this combination of results uh, is incredibly exciting in the context of that global ocean and the availability of the elements needed to um, uh, build life. On Europa, the, um, whoops, what's going on with the time there? That just switched. Total four, four minutes, okay. <laughs> well, I am not going to get through all of this. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so let's see, 9.54, okay. Um, good, well, let's get through uh, uh, Europa just very quickly. Uh, the surface of um, uh, 
Okay, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm actually going to skip a bunch of material on Europa's chemistry uh, and go to the energy situation. Um, so with Europa, we've got a lot of evidence of uh, chemistry from the ice shell implicating elements from a rocky seafloor. When it comes to that final keystone of energy, here's where things get particularly interesting. And you've heard uh, Ken and Diane and Paul and others talk about uh, the, the geochemistry needed to power life. And planet Earth has got so many different niches. Uh, and from a, uh, I like to break it down in just a, the, the chemical circuit that's needed to tap into the energy available in your environment. You need a positive terminal and a negative terminal. You need an electron donor and an electron acceptor. Worlds that have active hydrothermalism from the seafloor uh, may have plenty of reductants, but they might be oxidant limited. And so, as you saw at Enceladus, we may have lots of hydrogen coming out of an active seafloor, but if that hydrogen doesn't have a good oxidant to pair with, then all of the wonderful conditions within that ocean below might be um, unusable by life because there's no way to harness the chemical energy. On Europa, we've got Jupiter's magnetic field imparting about 125 milliwatts per square meter of charged particle irradiation on its icy surface. This irradiation leads to a radiolytic chemistry cycle that splits apart the water and other compounds that, that are on the surface and produces things like hydrogen peroxide and oxygen, which then get trapped in the ice. Uh, the Galileo spacecraft first discovered the peroxide, ground-based observations uh, first discovered the condensed phase oxygen. Um, I won't go into detail on these, but the, um, the amount of oxygen and peroxide within Europa's ice shell is sufficient, potentially, to power not just microbial life through, say, the delivery of sulfate, because sulfate also gets formed in Europa's ice shell. But the oxygen levels could, if Europa's ice shell is cycled on geologically short timescales, on timescales of, of 10 million years or so, the amount of oxygen within the ocean could be high enough to support animals. It could be high enough to support multicellular life. This uh, plot here shows molarity of oxygen and, and hydrogen peroxide in Europa's ocean for a given delivery period. In other words, how often is the ice shell cycling with uh, the ocean below? And based on the cratering surface age of Europa, its average surface age is about 60 million years. And in this plot, I actually subtracted out a bunch of geochemical reductants and tried to build up the oxygen even after uh, the pairing of reductants had been uh, taken away. And you can see that uh, we actually get above the O2 minima zones on Earth uh, once we get down below about the 20 million year time scale for, uh, for cycling. So let's see, um, do you want me to end now? Okay, I thought I was going to 10, okay. Um, Good. Uh, let's, um, uh, as we do talks, uh, or as we do questions, I will just play a video of the Europa lander, um, a mission that would potentially go and land on the surface. See if this starts. Oh, no, not that one. Let's see. There it is. Excellent. Okay, I'll finish there, and uh, hopefully we have time for questions. Yes, Um, is there any way to measure or are there any indications of 
uh, circulation or currents in the oceans underneath Europa or Enceladus? There's no evidence, but there are some very interesting models done, uh, in particular by Krista Soderlund of, um, uh, at UT Austin. And she's um, calculated that the currents could get as high as uh, a few meters per second uh, near the uh, ice shell boundary. Why aren't there, due to the craters, why aren't there craters on the south side? Why aren't there craters on the south side? Because of that plume activity and the fracturing. So uh, we don't fully know how subduction and, and extensional creation of, of new material might be operating. But uh, along the margins of the south polar terrain, you see um, ice that looks like it could be subducting. And those fractures may be uh, pulling apart kind of like oceanic crust uh, and allowing new material to be formed. Combined with that, those plumes are depositing essentially fresh Enceladian snow on the surface of Enceladus that covers up uh, any craters that, that might have been there. To the north, um, there's some there, there are a few folks who think that there might be faint plumes in the North Pole of Enceladus, and some of the craters do actually look muted, but I think that those craters are muted by the deposition of material from the plumes that got transported uh, from the E-ring back to the North Polar spots of, uh, of Enceladus. Is, is global ocean a closed book completely versus hemispherical or local? For Enceladus? Uh, for both. Uh, for Europa, yes, and for um, uh, for Enceladus, I would say yes, also. The the libration uh, on Enceladus is really hard to explain otherwise. Uh, so you said that the cycling of the stop icy shell should be taking place on a time scale of 10 million years. So do you really need like, to have that time scale for recycling for life to exist? Or can you have like, diff like this happening on different time scales? Because different mechanisms have been proposed for how the ice shell might be thickening or thinning with time. And so can like, longer time scales still like, no lead to? Like, exactly yeah, longer time scales are perfectly fine for, for the microbes. Um, and so I obviously didn't have time to get into, into it in too much detail. but the radiolytic chemistry um, leads to the production of sulfate. So you can't really see it on, on this, uh, with this projector, but the slightly grayer boxes here are species that we, we've detected on Europa. And there is a tremendous amount of sulfate on Europa's surface, and microbes love sulfate. So the microbes are going to be tremendously happy uh, even if the ice shell is cycled into the ocean on average once every 100 million years or even once every 200 million years. Uh, so there's plenty of sulfate in Europa's ocean. Uh, the, the prospect of getting a lot of O2 in there is a little more, um, so the, the, the abundance of O2 and peroxide is about an order of magnitude less than the, the sulfate. Uh, and so the time scale needed to, to oxygenate the ocean um, it's a, is, uh, is much shorter. Is it the case that the discoloration we see is actually ejecta from plumes or something onto the uh, clear ice surface and then remote sensing either from Earth or from the orbit would give us an idea of what the ocean itself consists of? So the, um, uh, let's see, this allows me to go back to one of the slides I had to skip. <laughs> so curiously, Enceladus, does, uh, the surface of Enceladus looks 
pretty bland, pretty, pretty white. Whereas Europa has got all of this different discoloration and different kinds of colors, reds, browns, yellows. Uh, and a few years ago, I did, in my lab up at JPL, uh, I did some experiments irradiating sodium chloride, which is normally a flat white and spectroscopically flat. And when I pulled it out of the chamber, it was this yellowish brown color and, uh, and it had some very distinct spectroscopic features. Uh, just recently, Samantha Trumbo, uh, Mike Brown and I had a paper that uh, Samantha led with um, using Hubble Space Telescope um, uh, time to search for these spectroscopic features on Europa. And she found one of the uh, hallmark absorptions associated with sodium chloride after irradiation uh, on Europa in a region that has this yellowish color that visually matches the lab data quite well. So we've got this beautiful uh, explanation for some of the discoloration on Europa as being sodium chloride from the ocean below, which then is irradiated. Uh, and without the irradiation, you wouldn't be able to see it. But with the radiation, it's like invisible ink all of a sudden becoming visible. 